now we're going to turn it over to Trevor to continue on with his presentation. Great. Thanks a lot, Dwayne. That was really good. And look forward again to uh, next week's. What this presentation is about today is the unveiling of our uh, anthropometric calculator. If you want to get a copy of it, it's uh, available right now in beta format on the OCAL website at www.ocal.on.ca slash ergo tools. And you'll find it, you can just click it and download it. It's currently in an Excel format, but we're hoping uh, with the revisions that are upcoming on our website, that it will actually be an interactive tool directly on the site itself. So to begin with, what is anthropometrics? Well, it's the practice of measuring different aspects of the human body. It measures all physical aspects. Uh, simple measurements are included, such as height and weight. It can also look at the specific examples, such as the length from your elbow to the tip of your finger or the circumference of your skull. And a complete anthropometric survey measurements are taken between every joint and across hinge joints, such as the knee and the elbow. Uh, body weight, of course, can be taken via uh, an analog or digital scale. Height is measured normally with a standometer. Body segments are normally measured either with a sliding caliper or a thoracometer. Uh, width, depth, skin folds are measured with a spreading caliper or a pelvimeter. Circumference are measured with soft measuring tapes. Now, why are we making this tool? Well, using anthropometrics, if you Google it, you can actually get over 7 million hits on Google. Uh, the majority of hits are for research articles, data for children, or nutritional health, not on specific anthropometric measurements. Uh, when I Googled anthropometric measurements for adults, over 6 million hits were found, with the majority of hits being for research articles and nutritional health. Uh, it's also difficult to act, find actual data tables. And at times there's actually a fee for access to be able to actually use the tables. Uh, another problem is that online sources are often not referenced or information is not given where the data came from. So here's an example of a table I found where I had no idea where this information was coming from. Uh, data may also only be given in specific percentiles. So if you're not familiar with where your person could fall, uh, it can make it difficult to calculate uh, the dimensions for the specific individual. So as I said, it may not include, also may not include the height you're looking for, for a smaller or taller person. Uh, there could, could be gaps in the data, depending on the uh, sample size. So for example, if they only looked at 50 people, there could be a large number of measurements uh, that are left out uh, due to different heights of the subjects. How reliable is the data you actually found? Uh, the population may not be what you're looking for. Often you'll find tables and it could be for uh, an Asian population uh, or if you're looking, you know, or if you want something for uh, North American. So you gotta be specific to the actual population that you're looking for the information from. And also some measurements aren't included. This was actually quite interesting when I was putting the tool together, how many uh, different anthropometric uh, documents were missing some of what I would consider the core measurements. Uh, some may also be based on link segment or proportionality constant models. Uh, are they gender specific? How accurate are they? And not all so, uh, segments correlate well with height, especially when using the link segment models. Uh, so for the data sources that we use to create the anthropometric tables, uh, we found the most reliable and consistent data sets were the anthropometric survey of US Army personnel conducted in 1988 and 2012, 
known as Ansir One, which had 4,000 uh, military personnel, 1,700 men, 2,200 women. The Ansir Two, which had 6,000 military personnel, 4,000 men, 2,000 women. And uh, of course, it's important to know that it's not an approximation for the standard civilian population. These are based on military personnel. And this information is available free at no charge. Another data source was uh, one known as CSER, the Civilian American and European Surface Anthropometry uh, Resource Project. It contained data of uh, 2,400 US and Canadian and 2,000 European civilians. It was conducted between 1988 and 2002. Uh, and if you want the full data set, it can cost $10,000. Now, summary tables can be found for free. The final data set we used was DIND. It collects 40 years worth of data. You have to register in order to be able to use it. And if you're not a university member there, access to the uh, core material is limited, but it is free. So when we combined the answer one, two, Caesar and DIND data sets, we actually come, came up with seven, a total of 7,000 male measurements and 5,000 female measurements that were combined to create the tool. Uh, data itself was separated based on half inch intervals and uh, it's available both in metric and imperial. Uh, the data for the intervals were grouped and averaged within each data set. The data was converted to metric from Imperial. Only the most relevant data for ergonomism designers were, was used. So for example, head circumference doesn't really benefit an ergonomist very much when it comes to uh, workplace modifications. And all the data sets were arranged by stature. So for example, here's uh, one of the data sets uh, that were rearranged with the height in inches, height in centimeters, weight pounds, weight kilograms, and then each measurement we used. And uh, three separate tables were created for the answer, one and two, and the dined. And then we summarized uh, or averaged the results within those to come up with the answer average for 62.5 inches, for example, the answer two, the dined, and then we incorporated the summary table information from Caesar. These four measurements were then combined together and averaged. So we actually had the average measurement across all four databases in order to try to get the most uh, sort of best estimate of what the true heights are at segment lengths for these individuals. So by combining the data sets, missing measurements and statures would now be included. So we wouldn't have those gaps. And we felt that the results became more representative of the general population. Now, to begin using the tool, you first need to determine which gender, units, and type of view you want. So we have it, uh, an introductory page on the tool where you select whether you want male or female, uh, a table view, which just displays the results in a table, or a figure view, which actually has figures uh, with the arrows indicating where the measurements are and whether you want to select imperial measurements or metric. Once you select that, you're then taken to the specific page. So in this instance, I selected male imperial table view. And you'll see there that there's actually a box that says height and inches. Uh, this is the only part of the tool you can actually manipulate. Everything else has been frozen to protect the data sets and the, the formula calculations. But basically you just click on the cell for height that you're examining. So for this example, 75 inches, and the table will repopulate itself. Uh, also, if you're not sure about where the measurements are, each page does have uh, conversion. So because we're in uh, inches here, if you enter your your dimensions in millimeters or centimeters, it'll calculate for you to be able to determine what the height in inches is. 
So then you select your desired height from the drop down menu. And then the data will repopulate itself based on a 65 inch person. So you can see how, for example, the seated head height went from 57.6 to 50.4. So this basically shows the complete view that you would get for a male with imperial data for 65 inches from the tool. Now this uh, would actually show the graphic view, just in case you want to actually see the table difference versus the uh, figure view. Now, what about applications of anthropometric data? Well, it's used quite a bit on nutritional and health status, clinical practice, clothing design, forensics, product equipment design, ergonomics, and determining sources of mismatch. It can be used to uh, for health, uh, used to determine obesity and malnutrition information. The body mass index is a great example of uh, that, which compares body fat based on height and weight that applies to adult men and women and is used to determine obesity rates. So by dividing uh, the height and the weight, you can actually get a determination of where you fall with respect to your BMI. So it's normally your weight divided by your height squared times 703 for imperial measurements, or for metric, it's just your weight divided by the height squared. So based on for example, the data from uh, the table, a 65 point inch, 69.5 inch male uh, should be expected to weigh about 191.5 pounds. So their BMI is determined to be 27.9, which deems them to be overweight. It can also be used for uh, determining sort of landmarks or uh, child development. I'm sure any of us that have had children have gone to our doctors and and actually had themselves be uh, the children be combined and placed on it. Yeah. Uh, with respect to uh, anthropometrics and forensics, uh, let's say there's been a series of break-ins that have occurred in a neighborhood, and a smudged foot or handprint was found on a window. What can this tell us about the burglar? Well, we can actually measure the length of the hand. We can then go to the table and the hand itself was 8.1 inches. This would mean if we actually started playing with the heights and found the hand length of 8.1 inches, it would tell us that the burglar could be a male who is 73.5 inches to 74 inches, or a female that's six, six or 70 inches to uh, 70.5 inches. In the workplace, workplaces must be designed for workers with a wide range of anthropometric characteristics. For a work area to flow efficiently and productively, the equipment and the people using it must be operating smoothly and cohesively. Any obstacle that creates reaching difficulties congestion or confusion can impair the work output and compromise safety. Now, uh, questions to ask is, does this person's body size fit in a workspace? If one worker fits in a workspace, can all workers fit there? So examples, safe clearances or heights for doorways and walkways, appropriate reaching distances for safety cords and equipment controls, reach levels, work heights that meet code requirements, Safety features including machine guards and protective shields, equipment control configurations, workstation and workflow design, uh, and accessible adaptations that comply with ADA laws for people with disabilities. So the common examples for anthropometric measurements and ergonomics, uh, you know, a seat depth would be compared to the buttock pup little height, monitor height, compared to seated eye height. Armrest, desk, keyboard, and mouse height is compared to seated elbow height. Seat height compared to seated popliteal height. Uh, and assembly line height would be compared to standing elbow height. The depth of a workstation 
compared to arm length, and the size of a mouse would be compared to hand breadth and hand length. So let's try a couple examples using the calculator. Let's say we have a five foot tall female worker who folds laundry at a table that is 36 inches high. What height should the folding table be for her? Well, the table itself, given uh, research, is that light work should be approximately 10 centimeters below standing elbow height. So standing elbow height for this individual is 99.6 centimeters. This means that by taking 10 centimeters off, the ideal height for her should be 89.6 centimeters or 35.3 inches. Uh, the table itself, uh, standard table height is 1.8 cent centimeters or 0.7 inches too high for her when we actually compare the data. Uh, for an office chair, I mean, can be used for office chair selection. I mean, we've talked numerous times over the years about the impacts of when a seat is too deep or too high or the armrest too high. So let's say a company wants to buy a chair that's 21 inches, has a 21 inch deep seat pan armrest at 27.2, and seat height of 25.6. The worker is a five foot nine male. Would the seat fit him? Well, we first actually change the height in order to uh, figure it out. So that equates to 69 inches. So the popliteal height would be 17.5 inches. Seated elbow height, 26.7, and the butter pop little length, 20.3. When we compare this, it turns out that the seat pan is actually 0 0.7, to, 0 0.7 inches too deep for him. The armrests are 0.5 inches too high, and the seat height is 8.1 inches too high. So does this current chair fit the individual? The answer is no, it wouldn't. Now, of course, the armrest height could be adjusted to the right height, as could the seat height. But because of the seat pan depth, they would need to go with the chair that was less deep than 21 inches. Uh, another example would be an assembly line. A five foot nine male is working at a table that is 36 inches high and 24 inches deep. He places items into a box every two seconds. The box itself is 12 inches high, 12 inches wide, and 12 inches long. Would the area fit him, and can he develop long-term sh uh, shoulder issues? Well, the worker's standing elbow height from the tool would be 43.1 inches, and their table height is 36. The box height is 12 inches, so with a combined height of 48 inches. This means to be able to reach and place items into the box, it's about five inches too high for him. But remember, he must also reach up and over the box edge to place the first item 12 inches inside and 12 inches away from him. Another example would be a five foot uh, one registered nurse. She states that she's having problems when using a medical cart. The cart work surface is designed to be the standing elbow height of the average male who's five foot 10. So what would the height of the cart be? And can the worker safely use the cart well, so we first put in the height for our female worker of 70 inches. And we find, oh, sorry, for the five foot 10 male, and we find that standing elbow height is 43.5. So that means that the medical cart is 43.5 inches high. We then calculate the standing elbow height uh, for the five foot one female and see that that is 38 inches. So when we compare the two, the surface of the cart is actually 10.5 inches too high for this worker. So in both examples, the subjects were forced to work with their arms elevated and outstretched. When the arms are moved away from neutral, the ability to generate maximum muscle force is reduced, resulting in the muscles having to work harder to perform the same task that would require less work uh, than with the arms in a proper position. With the muscles working harder and no longer in a position to generate maximum muscle force, they're now going to become more prone to a risk of injury. And that's it for my presentation.
Great. Thanks a lot, Trevor. It was excellent. There's a number of questions in the chat. Um, some of them are related to the um, the first presentation, and Melissa has answered them. Melissa, did you want to add anything, um, or or uh, discuss those questions at all? Um, I think we're good. I uh, unless someone else has a further question on it, but I think we've taken care of it. Thanks, Val. Great, thanks. Um, so then there were some questions and a bit of discussion around the term gender, which um, I'm not sure in you in um, this data, which of course was traditionally male and female. So, uh, but then also some of the uh, discussion is, um, I guess, have we considered um, alternate phraseology? And I'm not sure that we have. It's something that we ha we actually discussed when we, uh... We're putting it together. Um, if anyone does have any suggestions um, for to be able to distinguish the two, um, no, please email me uh, because we can still make alterations to it. But it was actually a topic that we widely discussed about. What ultimately brought us back was uh, based. It was based on your gender at birth, because traditionally, uh, no. If you're born male, you're going to have the same physical body length segments, uh, whether you uh, decide to transition or uh, uh, have a, a different type of lifestyle. So um, bottom line was genetically, your bone length would be a, related to that, that were, of which you were born with. But as I said, if anyone has any alternate uh, phrase that could be used, we are very open to uh, implementing that. Great, thanks. There's been ge some general enthusiasm expressed and excitement that the product is available on our er Ergo tools now as a download, uh, a downloadable Excel spreadsheet. And yes, it is on um, uh, Ergo tools, which we'll put the link in again. Actually, uh, it's right at the very bottom of my of my at the slide as well. I don't know if it's. Uh, yeah, I mean. yeah, and then uh, someone put it in again. That's good. Thanks. And uh, and yes, it's free and it's awesome. I I'm saying here. So here's a question: What seat height is used to determine seated elbow height? Is it seated popliteal height? Uh, I'm just gonna go look one the image just for a sec. Just give me one second. Popliteal is more uh, hip to knee, isn't it? No, so, no. Pop little height valves from the floor to the underside of the leg. Oh yeah, then um, yes. So yeah. So when these measurements were taken, what they actually did was actually had the subjects sit uh, in a neutral position. So these measurements are actually taken with them at a proper ninety degree um, posture. So. The, in this example, popliteal height wasn't used to determine uh, seated elbow height. They actually physically measured from the floor to the underside of the elbow in order to uh, measure seated elbow height. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I'm just trying to... Um, does the tool have the ability to filter out two of three data sets in case you want that data just from a single source rather than the average? No, it doesn't. It's actually combined based on the four data sets, um, which are available. If you Google them, you can find the data sets separately um, online uh, to help you if you wanted the specific ones that way. Um, I said the main reason that we actually combined them was basically due to the fact that there were missing height measurements for their subjects, as well as some of them were missing, uh, uh, for example, uh, standing shoulder height was not included in uh, one of the three data sets. So by combining them, it gave us the ability to try and give a more complete picture of uh, what was going on. But as I said, if you Google, for example, answer, answer to anthropometric data sets, it, you will find it on Google. Right. As, a matter, as a matter of fact, these are the the answers uh, and the dined and the Caesar are the four. If you're going to use them individually, they're the four I would recommend. Avoid any other data you're finding online um, because it really hasn't been well documented or validated in the literature. 
Great, thanks. Um, and yes, there's a question about the slides and uh, Vani has put in there that in fact they are, these ones are already posted, I believe, or and definitely they will be posted by the time the video, this is also being recorded and the video will be available uh, next week as well. Um, some more uh, question about our height measurements with or without shoes. Uh, they're taken without shoes. Great, and um, this is amazing. Another good top uh, feedback. Does seat depth use the BMI or weight in order to look at size of buttocks and not just femur length? No, it solely looks at the buttock popliteal length. And Trevor, did you use a correlation factor to compensate the height gain of the population according to the year of each of the anthropometric tables? Whoa, that's an interesting no. question. No. We did not. We simply took the data as it was. Great. And um, we've answered the slide. Definitely approves access to answer data and could be used a great communication tool. And people saying looking to see the application when designing bay levels in a warehouse. Um, and sorry, do you need height and weight to use? No, no. No, all you need is the actual height. Um, the weight calculator is once again, based on the average of the four data sets. Uh, so the only thing that you're inputting and from that drop down menu is actually just the height of the individual. Okay. And um, sorry, I'm pasting my thing so I see them and then I uh, lose track. So, um, who is the contact for questions with this going forward? I guess your email, will you put in the chat, Trevor? Sure. Or should we put ergo at ocow? Ergo at ocow.on.ca will work. Um, so our chair arm rests required slash beneficial if hands are resting on table. Actually, you know what? Um we should let that, because Duane and Melissa did the uh, office ergo part of it, why don't we let them answer that question? Mm -hmm. So Duane or Melissa, do you want to chime in? What was the question? Oh, sorry. It's uh, our chair arm, re chair arm rests required beneficial if hands are resting on table. That is arm rest. Uh, arm rests are not required, um, period. I mean, they're beneficial um, if you do a lot of data entry and you're you're typing a lot and you tend to stay in the typing position for long periods of time without without resting. Um, but they're not required. No, um, they should be utilized as a, a break time from performing your data entry. Um, so they're they're not necessarily something that has to be done or has to be have to be present all the time, and it also is dependent upon where your keyboard and mouse is located. Um, if you are utilizing a height adjustable work surface, or you're utilizing something um, where you end up pushing your keyboard and your mouse a little further away from the edge of the desk. Um, then your your forearms might utilize the desk or that surface uh, for um, in lieu of an armrest type of thing. So it depends on on where your where your devices are and what your what you're attempting to uh, to do with that. But I I guess a very short answer to that question is armrests are not essential. They're beneficial if utilized correctly. Great. Okay, good, an good answer. Thanks. And someone, Miriam, uh, has offered some comments uh, later in the chat as well. Um, so there's just a, a comment about a, cur a curious about the variance of common measurements as there may be differences spanning over the years. I guess just any comment on that, um, Trevor? Uh, it was actually interesting because I thought of that myself. And when I sort of so first put the data together, uh, combining the data sets uh, before I averaged the three to, or the four together, uh, you know, there really wasn't as much variability as we would, would have thought. Um, 
especially you know with the answer one data set being from about 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, we do know that body you know, sizes are changing, uh, but uh, I don't think we're changing at quite the rate that, uh, that like as quickly as would be determined. I think if we looked at data back from the 1940s, that's when we'd really start seeing some uh, substantial differences. But within the last 20 years, uh, there really wasn't that much variation between the body seg segments. Where we, there was more difference was with body weight um, between the data sets, where the more most recent data sets having you know, on average uh, 20 pounds higher compared to uh, you know, the first answer data set. Mm -hmm. But with respect to the body length segments, they were all very, very close to each other. So there's another question about, does the seat depth take into account the adequate space behind the knee to prevent contact pressure, or will an inch or two have to be subtracted from the buttock popliteal length to find this? When I did the calculation, I took off, well, I mean, you actually, I didn't talk about that in this presentation, but in our a previous one that we did on our office ergonomics calculator, uh, which is also currently under revision, built into the into the formula is taking away uh, three centimeters or one inch from uh, the seat depth to, to determine the best height. So when I said the person would need a 20, 20 inch chair, that was based on the fact that their butter popliteal length was 21 inches, the chair was 21 inches deep. So therefore to give clearance, you'd want at least something no more than 20 inches deep. So when you're calculating, when you're yourself comparing, buttock pop ladle uh, length to seat pan depth, always try and take away three centimeters just to give yourself, you know, at least an inch clearance. So, but that's, so the difference though, this is a calculator about human dimensions and how they uh, relate to each other. But the ergo calculator is about then how you uh, choose furniture based on those measurements. Yes. Right. So this, this, uh, um, is only is the actual measurements of people, not the chair. Exactly. When I was doing the comparisons, it was actually yeah. me doing those the math that should normally be done. Great. Uh, quick question for someone about uh, anyone have recommendations for a chair that can be adjusted high enough for a thirty-three inch desk? Desk. I assume that would need a higher lift. Hi Val, um, I, uh, I did answer that in the chat okay. is that you can get different cylinders in the yep, base yep. of the chair to prop you up, but you have to, I mean, uh, take into consideration too, if it's a 30, 33 inch high workstation, most likely that's going to place your feet. Um, they're not going to be supported by the floor anymore. So you're going to need a foot rest too. Mm -hmm. It's hard with office ergonomics. There's so many other complexities that you always say it depends. It depends, but it does. Well, someone made a point that the calculator is a good tool for estimate, but if you have the end user in front of you, you can measure all of these on your actual user versus using the estimate. That's true, um, especially in non-COVID times. I mean, the best way to do it is to physically measure the individual yourself, but there's times that you may not have that. I mean, there's different scenarios that this tool can be used. Uh, one of them for us is one of OCAL's services is determining work-relatedness of uh, compensation claims for injured workers. And with me and Subray and I have a client uh, up in Tim Timmins, which is a four hour drive, not really uh, that easy to get together with that four hour distance to do the measurements. So by just having someone's height, it's gonna give us as close as we possibly can of an estimate to where that person sh should be in order to determine mismatch and sources of injury. Mm -hmm. So the other, there's another question here that Melissa has answered in the chat about the angle of back. Um, the question about the office ergonomics reference guide, it will be, it's being built right now. And we're also in the, we're also in the position of actually transitioning our website. So uh, we hope to be able to share it live on the fourth Friday uh, of this series, which will be February 26th. Um, but until then, we only have our old Office Ergo handbooks on the website. And we have the Office Ergo calculator, too, that you can find some of this information in. A 
Okay, I think that's all. Um, and uh, but I think there's an excellent tool for design for for design for populations costs and caution about direct use for an individual as a, each data set for each criteria will have some variability. I don't know if you want to. There's anything more to be said about that, Trevor? Oh, yeah, I mean the only thing was by combining the four data sets, uh, we believe that we uh, eliminated a lot of that variability um, in order by averaging them all.